know, we just looked at it and it just, I couldn't believe my, my eyes. It's like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. And I just looked at the, the mass and it's bent. And I just, I yelled down to my wife, we just lost our mass. Hello and welcome to Trinidad. Just me at the moment as we've just had a quick trip to the UK and Judith stayed back for a few days to play with grandchildren. But never fear, there's a lot going on in this episode. I hope you like the film. Coming up, how to keep cool in Trinidad. Life in the boatyard, working through the jobs. And what would you do if you were dismasted over a thousand miles from shore? We talked to Ken about dealing with the unthinkable. This is the trailhead. I'm exhausted already because we had to walk up the hill. <laughs> I don't see how any car could have got up there actually. <laughs> no, it's a bit hot for walking. It is. But it looks like an easy trail and from here on in, hopefully some shade. And jungle. Yeah. <laughs> bamboo, look at that bamboo thing, that's amazing. Yeah, the bamboo here is, is a sight to see, look at it. Absolutely huge. Yeah. It's amazing. But yeah, we're going to uh, look forward to the first the dip in the waterfall, I think we would have earned it by the time we go. Absolutely. Yeah. Bamboo that is bigger than your hand. I'm looking for what's making this chirping noise, thinking that it might be a bird. But I don't think it is because it stops and does that. I think it's probably an insect about the size of your finger now. It can be very noisy out here. It's that time on the trail now. Do we go over or under? I think this one's an under. We okay. Can slide off it if we go down there. Oh, and the next one? This one's an over because you've got look. There's a handy bit in there. Oh yeah. <sighs> we can hear it. Yeah. And now we can see it. Yeah. Look at that. Maracas waterfalls are the largest single drop waterfall in Trinidad and they're quite spectacular, even in dry season. It's not a great flow, but it's certainly enough to keep you cool. Now here's a question for you. Is this a rock or is it a fossilised tree? Can't see any rings, but it very much looks like it's just a massive fossilised tree. So as Jude is convinced that the fossilised tree theory, you think this is one as well? I think that's one, and I think that one behind you is about to become one. So if you turn around, see. About to? Yeah. <laughs> we'll give it a million years or so. Yeah, just give it a million years. Yeah? Well, it's definitely a tree now. <laughs> Who knows? In a million years, it might be like this. Well, here we are at silly o'clock in the morning again. The only time when it's not too burning hot. And there's a walk just up from the shipyard through a jungle, a jungly forest. So that's what we're doing. You can feel in the air that it needs to rain, but it hasn't quite got there yet. So everything's just a little yellow and brown must be amazing when it's fully green.
I'm starting off with hand sanding until a reasonable hour, but I've got some temporary sunshades up, so I can continue on with the orbital sander through the heat of the day. It's a rush to get as much done as possible before our quick trip to the UK. A lovely time with family at Easter, and Judy stays on to help the grandchildren eat their Easter eggs while I get things shipshape on board. Well, the work continues back at the boat. I've polished all the top sides. Still up fairly well after all that work that we did in, uh, in Lagos in Portugal, cutting back the gel coat to, to good stuff. So hopefully that's going to be uh, worth doing. I have put some uh, anodes in here, but I've only got two. Um, I religiously keep uh, spares for everything, but this was a new plate uh, in Lagos because we had a problem with the freezer and the old one didn't have anodes, the new one does. <laughs> so I've got the two spares for this one. I didn't get two new ones for that and I can't get them here. And, and all of the, the chandlers, there's three chandlers here, none of which uh, do of them. So Judy's going to bring some out from, uh, from the UK. We'll be back in the water by then, going back in the water in a couple of days. So that's fine, I can just do it underwater. I've got my hooker thing, so that'd be the first job for, for that uh, underwater water. Uh, I have tried to do as much as I can on the, the prop. So I took the opportunity to put the grease nipples in and re-grease it and I've taken off what was left of the Velox off the blades which didn't stand up very well for some reason this time. Um, but yeah I couldn't get any more Velox here. They don't sell it in any of the chandlers. Um, so I was going to get some prop speed. I've used prop speed before years ago. I wasn't that enamoured with it to be honest. Um, but yeah I, they sell it in a small medium and large uh, tin and I thought well it's sort of a medium sized prop so I'll get the medium one. But it was 550 US dollars is what they wanted to charge for it. So there's no way I'm gonna, I was gonna pay that. So what I've done is I've just uh, put some uh, lanolin on here. That's one of the sort of uh, things that you used to use in the old days. It's sort of, um, it's from sheep's wool. It's just, a, it's just a grease from sheep's wool. And people say that works. Somebody else actually just after I put this on uh, commented uh, that you can also use egg white. They use egg white and that works. I would have, I would have tried that if I hadn't already put the, uh, mm. the lanolin on. But yeah, got to, got to do something. Um, but hopefully, I mean, I'm going to be swimming on it now in the tropics every day so I really don't think it's going to be a problem I can go down there and uh, and just keep keep it clean so I didn't end up taking the rudder off I've been thinking of doing that for a while I mean not because there's anything in it I, mean, I can't actually really find any play in it at all if you get a lever in there you can just about move it but um, you know I haven't ever had them off don't know when they were last changed if ever so it'd be worth uh, taking them off and putting some new bushes in um, they could do it here really well they're great for that but uh, it probably would have taken a couple of weeks to get the new bushes milled I don't know what size they are so I'd have to get it all off and then take them to the shop and get them milled um, and yeah it might take a few weeks and I want to get back in the water really so didn't do that um, the other thing is I was going to uh, to do some stuff with the prop shaft, take that off, uh, change the seal. But the seal's good, the dripless seal that I've got is, is seems to be working absolutely fine, so I'm not too worried about that. And there's a tiny bit maybe of movement in the cutlass bearing here, but again, hardly anything, so I'm not too worried. And if I do it in the States, when I, when I do it, I can take this prop off and take it to PYI, who do all the best stuff. They, they look after Max Prop, so they'll do the servicing uh, and they're based in the States. So I think once we're uh, up the East Coast, that's what I'll do. So that's just about everything down below the waterline, but I've got quite a lot of stuff going on up on deck. So I'll show you what's happening up there. Oh, my automatic lights come on. I put that on yesterday. Uh, got to adjust it so it doesn't come on in daylight. Although it is actually quite cloudy today, let's, which is really quite nice because it's been really hot. But yeah, this, this is my old one that I changed. It's lasted about, I don't know, five years. I think I put it on there. Uh, it started going a bit weird. Hopefully this one's better quality. It's uh, uh, all in one piece as well. So I've mounted it a bit differently. I mean, it's a good thing to have, I think, in the, uh, in the Caribbean. People talk about, you know, having problems with dinghies and you know, that sort of stuff. And we always lock ours up at the back here if we think there's any sort of problem. Just put uh, one of the wire cables, I'll use these, uh, and lock it to the to the stern but yeah having the automatic light there as well if anyone comes up at night then that'll come on so that'll be good there's lots of sanding going on uh, doing the tow rails that had uh, international wood skin on i've been sort of patching them up 
for the last few years, uh, but they need a, a proper go. It's been about seven years now that it's been on there, so it's pretty good uh, using my nice orbital sander. This is the one that I got to do the top sides with, with that 3M's stuff. Um, it's really good for these. I'm doing the deck as well. Don't often sand the decks, but once every four years, but once it starts to get really ridged, uh, you want to try and just take them down a little bit because uh, they just get dirt stuck in them. Otherwise, it's not, it's not a good idea. So as soon as that's all cleaned up properly, I'll put some Semco on. But yeah, there's a lot of wood, obviously, all the eyebrows need doing. Uh, lots and lots to do. I'm going to do all the bulwarks as well, but I'm actually going to wait until we add an anchor. I can do it from the dinghy rather than on the, the plank because it's quite high up on the plank to, to do it there. And uh, it's quite an industrial anchorage, so I don't mind uh, having the, the sand going out there. I wouldn't do it in a lot of other anchorages. And obviously I will wait until we add an anchor to do all the varnishing as well because it's just less dust and uh, should be better. Oh, I've got to put this up as well. New pennant from uh, the Ocean Cruisers Club that was waiting for us back in the in the UK. Now they've earned their money already because we got money off insurance for being a member of those. So that's that's really good. But the job I'm mainly doing up here is lines again. I mean, look at this. These haven't washed this one yet. And if you've been watching this season, I've done them about four or five times. I mean, I suppose we have sailed several thousand miles, probably about 4,000 miles last season. So salt spray and all that dust from, uh, from Africa. It's just, you know, really, really bad. So yeah, they're all getting a, a wash uh, and a bit of a condition. I'm gonna do all of them. Uh, I'm not gonna do the dock lines though because our old dock lines are going. These are the old Octoplat ones we had. This is a bit of a present for Judy. CMP makes some really fantastic double braid dock lines. I mean, look at this, this one's 40 foot long. I can easily pick it up with one hand. So Judy's going to really love these because these things are just really so heavy. And they got really creaky in Madeira. Uh, if you saw that episode, we had a bit of swell there. And these, the noise they were making, they just get, they get dirt and salt and stuff in. There's nothing you can do sort of to get it out as they get old. Um, it's a single strand type six nylon, the right amount of stretch, really strong, uh, really nice hand splice loop on one end and nicely finished on the other. So yeah, I really are impressed with these uh, and they won't squeak. They, there's, there's enough gap between them, nice and softer between the uh, outer and inner on the double braid. There's, there's, you know, there's just nice and loose because some of them can start to squeak after a while if, uh, if they're too tight. So really impressed with those. And look, this is the, this is a part that came in a box with all of those, which I carried back. And I thought, oh, they must have only sent half of it because I couldn't carry this. It's the same as, as that rope there. It's the same length, it's the same size. Um, there's no way I could carry all that stuff at once. I just all carried all this over in one arm. So I'm just gonna stow them all on a line up here. And I can just tie this in permanently. So they all, can all hang there nicely. And then when I want one, whatever one I want, I can just, take out because you've got the little velcro holder really useful loving that okay well look at that we're uh, just about done so four days it's taken in the uh, all the hand rails the eyebrows light sanding on the decks uh, the tow rail there's some bits and pieces on the tow rail that i can't get to with the uh, orbital sander because it's just too big to get in there so I'm going to finish off now with the fan which is very good for getting in those little bits and pieces but one thing I should say you should notice where, uh, where I'm plugged in I'm plugged into the boat for all this power and that's because uh, we're stateside now so obviously it's all 110 volts so all my all my power tools wouldn't work properly on here they'd be very slow uh, but the boat's got a system where it just detects what uh, what you've got coming in so if you've got 110 60 hertz it would just automatically put that up to uh, 220 at 50 hertz and everything works properly on the boat uh, so yeah something to think about if you if you've got a boat that you're going to cross oceans in that you've got to be prepared for that sort of thing obviously worse the other way around if you're coming from the, the states to, to Europe Europe, you just blow everything up if you start plugging your 110 stuff into 220. So yeah, good idea to get something like that installed. It's a race to get it all done, working late on the last day. Well, it's the morning that we splash, but we're getting splashed a little bit early because uh, it's been pouring with rain all night and that's what the decks look like. I'm supposed to be doing the, uh, the varnishing once I get out there. That's not going to happen for a while. But I mean, the, the island needed some rain anyway, so that's okay. I can do some other jobs uh, 
Just need to get ready now. Just been uh, pumping up some of the fenders. Let me show you, actually. These are the fenders. We showed them in the, the five best for things, one of our sort of best things for your boatless video. These Fendertex fenders that we got from uh, PYI at uh, Annapolis are fantastic because uh, they just blow up and uh, yeah, you can just deflate them and store them anywhere. But these covers I just bought back from the from the UK because they uh, they make them in France, so I thought it was easier to send them there. And uh, yeah, they're fantastic. Look at that. Whatever way around it is, you've got our logo. So we're going to look pretty spiffing at the dockside now with our new fenders and our new lines. It's going to look good. The rain has subsided by the time we're loaded onto the travel lift, but I'm sure Fair Isle is looking forward to the real wet stuff. You can almost hear a sigh as her keel touches the water. Well, it was a bit hectic clearing out the no crew, but it was okay. I had to put uh, a couple of bow lines on because they wanted to take the slings out of the way because they had the ropes on, so they didn't want to risk getting that around the prop. So uh, it's a little bit of jiggling around trying to keep it in position and, uh, and get through, but did a good job. We're out, let's get in the anchorage. The sun is out now, but I can't trust it to stay that way, so the varnishing can wait and I'm working my way through the list of other jobs. First is a new line for the flag halyard on the port spreader. There we go, the little OCC flying fish can get raised. Well, it's another rainy day today, so I'm not getting any varnishing done, but I'm doing a few good inside jobs. I spent all morning actually just fitting this little fan which is lovely. I'll put a link in the description. It's uh, just something I got off Amazon. It's a Scirocco 2, but it's really neat. You can just sort of put it in any direction. It's really quiet and uh, three speed. Very expensive though, but uh, yeah, it's taken me all, all morning to put up because I had to get the, the wire through this. This isn't headlining, so you can't actually take it off. You've got to try and pull things right through it to get, to get anything in there. So yeah, it was a bit of a pain, but done now so good I can sit this and oh, have this on me because I can't have the uh, hatch opened in the rain uh, but this afternoon's job is this my lovely Spectra water maker which has worked perfectly for the last what, two years that I've had it now it's going to have a bit of a makeover with its filters I always use the the proper five micron Spectra filters it's a mistake to use uh, cheaper filters because these paper filters if you've got cheap paper filters they can start breaking up and getting your membrane and that's it's just a false economy it's more trouble than it's worth uh, but someone has now sent me these to try which are a stainless steel version of uh, the filter they filter better than the paper versions and obviously last a whole lot longer so I've got two of them these are from poor pure ocean marine so that's the 5 micron one and there's a 20 micron one um, so at the moment I've just got the 5 micron um, that's the way Spectra fitted it here with uh, one filter housing there so I'm going to put another one on and that's going to just be mounted on here uh, and I'll put the 20 in there so I go through the 20 first and I think with it that way around it should last a hell of a long time actually and I can just sort of clean them as I go along I'll have a chat with the manufacturer about the best way to clean them and I'll, I'll let you know what you know how that works but yeah I think it sounds like a really good idea now while we've been in the yard a few of you have asked if we've seen Aquarius the ML Super Marimu, which suffered a double dismasting in the Atlantic just before we crossed. They've shown a bit of what happened on their YouTube channel Sailing Aquarius, but I haven't shared the full details yet, so I thought I'd better track down Captain Ken and find out what happened. I found him working on not one, but two ML Super Marimus. The masts for these boats have some fittings unique to AMLs, and all have in-mast furling. So they're quite hard to come by. But did you see this about a month ago on Sail Life? There is this Amel here, which is kind of fascinating. I mean, it looks like a good refit candidate for us, but uh, apparently from what we've heard, it's not for sale. Looks like Ken beat you to it, Mads. 
the boat cleaned up remarkably well and the master in great shape. So they're off and ready to be fitted to Aquarius. So, middle of the Atlantic, worst possible time. You lose both masts. What, what was the first you, you knew of there being a problem? Well, we were 1,286 nautical miles off the coast. So we're, we're in three and a half meters of seas and you know, we're just riding the waves and we're, it's all downwind sailing. So we were wing on wing. We had pulled out on, 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 on the port side. So anyways, you know, we're surfing down one of the waves. We backwinded our jib. And uh, when it popped back in, it, it basically put so much pressure, I think, on the, the main that it collapsed the main. And, you know, we just looked at it and it just, I couldn't believe my, my eyes. It's like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. And I just looked at the, the mass and it's bent. And I just, I yelled down to my wife, we just lost our mass. Everybody thinks that, um, you know, things just happen real fast. They don't happen that fast. It's all a process. It's all slow. The main will come down. It will only come down as far as the triadic will, will let it. And then you start rocking back and forth. And then the main keeps on bashing into the mizzen until something breaks on the mizzen. And then the mizzen and the main both come down at the same time. So it's been held by all the stays and, and the four sails because yeah. they're all in place. There's no, no problem with any of those. All the sails in place, the, the four stays still in place. So there's a lot of things holding the, the, the mass from moving too quick. It's got to pull a lot of, lot of stuff around before actually the, the main comes down. We have actual film of when the mizzen actually was shaking because it already broke one of the, the, the shrouds. So it had broke one of the shrouds and now the mizzen was shaken and I just told my wife, it looks like both of them are coming down. Yeah. And you know, in that 15 minutes, I was able to, maybe it was a half an hour, you know, time just like- I'm sure it seemed like it, half an hour, yeah. Man, it's just like, you don't imagine in, in the middle of the ocean with all this going on, I, I really can't tell you how much time it took, but I had time to, get ropes around the Genoa because the Genoa is big and it, if it catches wind, you know, it could go all over the place. So I got ropes around that and I was able to tie it, tie it up before the, the main came down. And that was kind of dangerous. Because well, it's a really precarious position, if, yeah, to be on there with, with bits, of, bits of rigging coming down around you. I could have been killed at that point and there's nothing you can tie to at that point. You're on the boat and there, if you tie to anything, that might take you over. So you don't want to tie to anything. So you're just out there. And I actually got a line around the upper part because I was throwing it up and over. And I'll tell you what, a lot of people say that there was like, oh, you must have been in a, like wind and you must have been doing something crazy. Look, you can, in the videos, you can see there was hardly any wind. And I'll tell you what, in 30 knots of wind, me trying to get those sails under control, it wouldn't have happened. But probably unusually for something like this, because all the, the shrouds and the stays are in place, it's coming down and sitting on the deck. It's not going over. So there's, I mean, there's pluses and minuses to that, isn't it? Over the deck, you know, you've got problems with it smashing into the hull and maybe yep. holding you. But other problems with it being on deck, what, what were the problems you had to deal with there? Well, the, the problems with it being on deck was the, the mizzen was hanging out so far behind us. We had a wind uh, generator on. And so that, I was trying to pull the, the mizzen onto the boat and then the, the wind generator platform got in the way. So I had to go out, drill all the holes oh, out yeah. and then pound it off. And then I had the, the wind generator off. So then I winched it closer onto the boat. So I'm winching the, the, the mizzen mast back onto the boat because it's hanging way too far out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, I get it about four, five meters back onto the boat, just winching it onto the boat. Now at that point, when all this is happening, I would imagine from what you've said, adrenaline's kicked in, you're just getting done what needs to be done. How was your wife feeling? How did she react to this? What, what was happening? Well, she, she thought we were in a dream and we didn't sleep or eat for three days after that. Mm. We were just like doing stuff. But uh, after that, we took a nap and she woke up and she goes, I thought I was in a dream the whole time. But, you know, my wife handled it like a champ. Yeah. She was a complete champ. Once you've got the, the initial things done that need to be done so you're so safe on the boat, what, you're then thinking about how the hell do you get to some land, aren't you? How are you going to save your boat? Because you're safe. There's no fire. There's no, the boat's not sinking. But 
you know, you don't want to abandon your boat. What, what were you thinking? How were you going to get back? Well, we thought we had enough fuel to make it, but uh, we ended up uh, having to get a lot of fuel. And so we got a hold of the Coast Guard pretty fast, and the, I think it's the Viking fleet was behind us. So they, they knew us as well, so they were following us. So they did a lot for us. And as soon as we got our Starlink back up going, and I tell you what, it was a godsend not to have the Starlink actually up someplace. We actually took the antenna inside, waited till everything fell, and then we got the, the Starlink back working again because that saved us because now we're in constant con um, conversation with the Coast Guard. Yeah. And the Coast Guard actually sent two vessels to us. One during the day came to us, gave us 260 um, liters of fuel, and you can watch our YouTube channels to see the, the people that did that for us. And I mean, that was a godsend. It's a tricky thing, isn't it? Much more tricky than people think to try and get you know something large and heavy like that from one boat to another, because you can't just go alongside. Can yeah, you no, no. You, you, they, they have to drop it in the water. Ropes have to go over, and you have to haul it in. And we had to keep moving because of the way we were rigged. Um, with all the stuff hanging off, we had to keep on moving. Yeah. Yeah. At any stage during that, you went for the fuel option. Were you, were, did at any stage you think of trying to jury rig? What did you have left to attach to? Um, I could have jury rigged if I really had to. If I, but uh, look, as long as your engine running, mm. you keep it running. Mm. All these people that say, oh no, you should have jury rigged early. No. They've, there's been talk of like so many people getting injured trying to jury rig something up, and then you have more problems than if you have just running your engine. Um, and, you know, there's boats out there. I mean, you're probably 15, 20 nautical miles away from another boat. Mm. Almost all the time you're crossing any of the oceans. Now you can see it on uh, marine traffic. You can actually see all the boats out there. So if you have Starlink, you can just look at all the boats out there. You can, like, call up Coast Guard and say, you know, I need this boat to divert to me. Yeah. And it'll be there in, like, three, four hours. Yeah. And Starlink's a game changer, isn't it? In that it's way. a game changer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You're now here, you've got not one ML, but two, because yeah. you've, got, you've bought another ML because it's got decent masts on it, so you're taking the yeah. masts. Go through that decision, because obviously you're insured, you're with Velos, actually, the same, same, same as us, so it's good to know that they're, they're doing a good job with this. But, but why didn't you just go to Selden and buy new masts? It's 120,000, and uh, if you're insured for so much, you know, they'll only, they'll only pay out so much. So if I would have gone the, the way of new masts, it's, it's, it's too expensive. Yeah, same with the car. I mean, they, they, they want to write off the car if it becomes more expensive than what the car's worth. Plus, if you have a 68 Mustang convertible, and then you start putting uh, 99 you know, parts on your 68 Mustang convertible, yeah. it's not a 68 Mustang convertible anymore, and it doesn't hold the same value. Yeah. Finally then, I know that you might not be able to say too much about this, because you, you want to sort of work out exactly what's happened with the, with the old masts, with people looking at that. But people are going to say, how does that happen? You know, you've got all your shrouds, everything in place, and the mast just folds. What, I mean, what, what do you think you're going to find out going forward, and what can you say at the moment? Well, there's some issues, and we're going to discuss those in later videos. Yeah, and, um, but uh, I do want to talk to a few naval architects mm. um, before I, I have the, the video come out. And um, something will be coming out in the next three, four months yeah. on our channel. Yeah. And it'll, it'll talk about the whole process of what happened, when it happened, in the history, you know, what other boats had the same thing happen mm. as happened to us, and one other boat did have the exact same thing happen to them mm. that happened to us. We're going to talk about that. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll discuss, you know, safety at sea and what I think about it now that I've gone through this, and I, I don't know of a lot of people that have been dismasted so far out and actually made it back. Yeah. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. No, it's not, no. Well, well done. Not easy to talk about either, so thank you, Ken, for doing that interview. Uh, it's actually the first time Ken's seen a lot of those pictures. Uh, couldn't bring himself to look at them until now. Uh, so do check out his channel. I'll put a link in the description, and they will be making a video, a full video, on how they uh, got that boat back safely, so that's going to be interesting. Uh, for us, uh, Judy is back in a couple of days' time, so I've got uh, quite a bit of varnishing still to do. She's going to bring some boat parts back with her as well, so I'll have other work, but this is really the start of our Caribbean 
an adventure because we will be setting off pretty much straight away. We want to get up and into lovely clear waters and do some swimming and uh, do, do some exploring. We've got one of our daughters coming out to, to St. Lucia in about a month's time. So yeah, it's all gonna it's all gonna be good. So do keep watching and to all our patrons, thank you as ever so much for doing this. We can't do it without you. For our subscribers, if you haven't subscribed, please do it. I know we say it every time, but it's really important for us. It costs you nothing and it really helps us out. But for everyone, thank you for watching.